So I think as a, as a patient, it's important to know that you know, no clinical trial is usually no treatment. It's always the current standard of care, be that this certain kind of chemotherapy, this certain type of surgery, this certain type of radiation, and then it's usually plus something else. So it's not like people don't get treated. They still get at least the best treatment we have out there with the possibility of another advancement, which the reality is it's in trial because we don't know if it's better or worse. We think it's safe because it's gotten as far as this trial, but the reality is we don't know if it helps or not, and therefore your contribution is really important in letting us know if this helps beyond what's already out there. Uh, in my view, uh, admittedly a biased one, I think if you have an opportunity to participate in a clinical trial um, of the type that we're referring to, I think that's something you ought to consider. It's very unfortunate in this country that far less than 5% of cancer patients participate in clinical, tri clinical trials nationally but there's not a single device or drug that has ever been approved by the federal government that has not gone through a clinical trial process. So if one takes the position that wants to see, one, one wants to see an improved result tomorrow when compared today, the vehicle for that is clinical trials. I hear this from time to time from my patients. I don't want to be, um, quote, experimented upon, unquote, um, or, um, quote, I'm fearful I won't get a, any treatment, unquote. That, that's simply not the case in the vast majority of clinical trials, whether they be cancer related or some other disease um, involved. So there are so-called placebo controlled trials, uh, or you're already giving an active drug and, and the placebo is in addition to the active drug and the other arm may be the active drug plus the experimental drug, and one's trying to tease out uh, in that sort of trial what added benefit, if any, is derived from the experimental drug. You give people into a trial that compares two regimens, both of which are reasonable, but does it in a formal way so you can compare them. The future of treatment is based upon high-quality clinical trials. So what I say to patients and families with cancer is part of your dialogue with your physician should always be what is the role in clini of clinical trials going to be in the care for me? And do I need to seek someone who has that available to me so that I can balance what you want to do and what else might be available? Don't be afraid of the placebo controlled trials many of which actually have what's called a crossover, which means that if there's a new drug uh, being tested, if, it, if the combination you're on doesn't have that drug and your tumor starts to grow, they often let you cross over and get the new drug afterwards. I talk with my patients about what's standard. We talk about what is the likelihood of a standard treatment working, and then I talk about if I have a trial that makes sense for them, what the trial is, how it compares to the standard, the question we're trying to ask why we think it might be better. And I always explain that we don't know. If we knew it was better, it wouldn't be a trial. Um, but we wouldn't know anything about any of the treatments if we didn't have clinical trials and people hadn't gone on them. Um, and then we sort of talk through it together. It's, it's different for each person. I don't have one way I, I go through it. But I always make sure they know what's the standard and why we're doing the study that we're doing. When we do specific trials, um, we have what are called eligibility criteria. And we have specific trials for patients who have never been treated with uh, chemotherapy or therapy. Then we have trials with only one treatment. Then we have trials for people who have had two treatments and so on. Um, so if you rush into a second treatment before you look at your options, then you may not be eligible for those trials anymore. Clinical trials come in all shapes and forms. They're, they're a lot like your children. Um, you know, they may have the same genetic background, but they behave and act differently sometimes. I think it's a chance to do two things. It's a chance to sometimes offer yourself a new or novel technology that's not available to everybody, and also to contribute to the field in general and to move the science of lung cancer forward. Um, you know, it's a personal decision. Obviously, uh, many patients feel like they don't want to be um, a guinea pig, for example, but um, you know, we would not have new therapies and new ways to treat patients and advances in, in the disease um, without patients participating in clinical trials. I mean, there was a time when we thought it was incurable. It's not true anymore. 
you know, we know a lot of people pass away from their lung cancer, but that it's a heterogeneous disease. There's lots of different time courses. Our cure rates are way better. And then I guess I always want to tell patients that even if they're in a position where things aren't good for them, that I hope they participate in trials and tissue collection and everything they can to help move the field forward because there are going to be people who follow them, unfortunately, and we need their support to go further.